In New Zealand, a typical winter morning begins. The sun rises, suddenly dims for a moment, but then starts shining again. This flash awakens a man sleeping in his home. He doesn't understand what's wrong with the world until he notices the strange silence of the radio and phone. Nevertheless, the man gets ready for work and sits in his car. On his way, he stops at a gas station, but the attendant is nowhere to be found. He notices smoke coming from the kitchen door and, upon investigating, finds a burnt kettle, but no people. Zack checks the street toilet, but it's empty. It's then that he realizes that he hasn't seen a single person all morning. Zack continues driving, maneuvering around cars abandoned right on the road. Suddenly, he imagines seeing movement behind the windows of a house, but no one answers his knock. So, he breaks in, and upon entering the kitchen, finds a fountain of water shooting out from a tank. Zack, for some reason, turns off the tap and goes into the bedroom. There, he sees an imprint of a human body on the bed and an unfinished breakfast on the table, as if the homeowner just evaporated. Zack continues on his way and nearly crashes into a truck abandoned in the middle of the road. He tries to use its radio, but there's only silence in the air. The city greets Zack with emptiness. He notices a nearby fire and discovers the burning wreckage of a passenger plane, but there are no bodies, only empty seats. It seems that all living things, both animals and people, disappeared in the space between between the ticking of the clock. Zack goes to the laboratory where he worked before the strange accident. Although the equipment is functioning, there is no communication with any of the world's laboratories, and a message on the monitor states that Operation Flash is completed. Then, he sees his boss at the control panel, but upon touching his shoulder, he realizes that he is dead. An alarm starts to sound, the radiation level is sharply rising, and Zack realizes that the experiment they were conducting has ended in failure. He must escape. Escape. But with the entrance doors locked, he improvises a gas bomb while listening to his dictaphone recordings describing the project as having phenomenal destructive potential. Today, July 5th, he, Zach Hobson, is the last person on Earth. At this moment, the gas cylinders explode, blasting the doors open, and Zach gains access to the other floors. He doesn't lose hope of contacting someone and sends a signal with his phone number into the network. Then, he writes announcements of the same content everywhere he can, but the phone remains silent. Zach finds a police car and broadcasts his message through the streets, to no avail. After a week of attempts to contact other people, Zach moves into a luxurious mansion and begins to loot the expensive stores of the city. He drives trains and plays billiards by himself. But despite the surrounding luxury, his mental state begins to deteriorate. One day, he puts on a woman's nightgown and declares himself president of this quiet earth, delivering speeches in front of cardboard images of Adolf Hitler, Queen Elizabeth II, and Pope John Paul II. When the power goes out, Zack, losing his mind, goes to a church, shoots, and removes a Jesus statue from the cross, and declares himself God. After that, he comes across a huge truck, and driving it into town, he runs over a baby stroller. Something snaps in his mind, and he rushes to the stroller, only to find it empty. Sitting at the wheel, he puts the barrel of a shotgun in his mouth, but refrains from pulling the trigger. This incident helps him snap out of his madness. Zack returns to a normal life, swimming in the ocean and setting up his home with a generator. One morning, while gathering necessary items, he sees a young woman with a gun, but suddenly she throws herself into his arms, overjoyed to finally meet someone alive. In the evening, she shares her survival story after the disappearance of her loved ones. She also saw the body of a deceased baby, undecayed. Zack shares his feelings, feeling as if they are dead and in another galaxy. Joanne, falling asleep mid-conversation, dozes off on the couch. Zack, afraid to leave her side, drinks champagne all night, affecting his condition in the morning. They now begin exploring the deserted cities together. They stop at a roadside motel, where Joanne suggests they continue searching for people. The next day, they split up. Joanne goes to one part of the city and Zack to another, keeping in touch via radio and agreeing to call every half hour. But their search yields nothing. Suddenly, they both feel a strange pulsation. Joanne calls Zack, but 
and everything settles down. Later, they meet for dinner, and Zack explains the experiment. Scientists were trying to create a wireless global energy network to power military equipment, hoping they aren't responsible for the disappearance of people. Later, the couple goes to the motel and becomes closer. Zack and Joanne continue to explore the cities. One day, while Joanne shops in fashionable boutiques, Zack gets ambushed by cars. Circling the streets, he's cornered by a truck emerging from an alley. Zack is caught by a masked man pointing a gun at him and lies about being alone. When the man, believing Zack, removes his mask, Joanne's voice comes through the radio. Under the threat of the weapon, Zack takes the new acquaintance to meet Joanne, who emerges in a beautiful new dress. Seeing her, the man lowers his gun and smiles. The three embrace, no longer alone, and continue their journey together. Settling down for the night, they try to understand why only they remain. They determine why they survived. At the moment of the effect, they all experienced death. Appy was drowning during a fight with a friend. Joanne was electrocuted due to a faulty hair dryer, and Zack had an overdose of pills, feeling guilty about the dangerous experiment. And all of them saw a red light they didn't want to return from. Later, they stop at Appy's house, where he sits down at the piano and plays for his new friends. At night, hearing singing, Joanne steps outside and sees Appy singing at the grave of an elderly woman. She returns to the house and sleeps separately from Zack. A love triangle begins to develop but Zack is more concerned with his scientific observations. Meanwhile, Joanne discovers that Appy killed a friend's wife, which is what caused their fight. She's shocked, but Appy is unapologetic. It was a necessity, and he decides his own actions. Zack finds the woman in a state of confusion and tries to find out what happened, but she refuses to talk. Zack attempts to take Joanne away from Appy's house, but Appy objects. Why should he make decisions for others? Is he the eldest here? Zack accuses Appy of having hurt the woman, and Appy takes his words as racist criticisms. In the end, an angry Zack gets into the car and drives away, but Appy follows him. Joanne also finds a free car and sets off in pursuit. Appy catches up with Zack and forces his car off the road. Fortunately, Zack is only slightly injured. Appy comes down to confront him, but Joanne, arriving at the scene, pulls a shotgun out of Appy's car and points it at the fighting men, tired of their rivalry. Then, Zack confesses that he swallowed pills because he understood the danger of his experiment. The group continues their journey together. Appy tries to understand how scientists could have allowed such a disaster. Zack blames the Americans for not providing all the data, and others for not understanding the full horror awaiting Earth. They reach a house where Zack finds computer data, indicating another catastrophe will happen at 6 a.m. the next day. Suddenly, another flicker occurs. Appy sees the floor become a wall, and Joanne can't find her companions, panics, and starts calling for them. Zack exits onto the street through a transformed corridor as everything returns to normal. Appy embraces Joanne, who is recovered, and blames Zack for miscalculating the time. It already happened, but Zack insists it was only the beginning. Appy suggests disabling the system by destroying Zack's lab. The man leads them to an explosives warehouse, and the three, setting aside personal conflicts, load a truck full of explosives. Zack reminds that his boss pressed a button and a cataclysm occurred, but the anomalies continue to this day. So, it's not about the button. Then, Appy recalls an incident when an Indian boy accidentally broke a staff at the beginning of an eclipse and thought that he was to blame, but Zack is sure it's all about the energy system and heads for the machine while Joanne is being nice to Appy. Zack watches them for a while, then calls them to the car. On the way, he asks Joanne who she would stay with if everything works out. The woman admits that it's hard for her to decide. She likes each of them in their own way. Zack bitterly notes it seems to him that those two have known each other for a long time and act as guardians for the scientist. Then, the woman tells that Appy's friend wanted to kill him because his wife fell in love with Appy, but Appy rejected her and she took her own life. Appy believed he was to blame for this. Zack is surprised by such nobility and asks Joanne not to worry about him. The woman kisses the scientist and they almost get into an accident. Appy, arriving in his truck filled with explosives, tries to push the obstacle off the road while Joanne and Zack await an explosion in horror. But 
he drives around it, and Joanne suddenly jumps into his cabin. Zack follows and suddenly receives a danger signal from the laboratory, trying to stop the truck, but Appy thinks Zack is just jealous and turns off the radio. Zack manages to stop the truck and explain the danger level. They won't be able to get close enough to the laboratory for complete destruction due to radiation levels. The trio stops at a post, and Zack explains that when the lights of the laboratory go out, the system will fail. He has a control panel that will allow him to drive the truck to the right spot. He goes to the city to get the device, and they must wait for him there. Zack gets into the car and sees Joanne and Appy kissing. After their intimacy, Appy confesses he will sacrifice himself by driving the truck, doubting Zack's device can control the vehicle. Besides, he's a driver, and his late mother has long been calling him. They then hear the truck and see a huge bomb moving towards the laboratory. Appy realizes Zack deceived them, but it's too late to do anything, as the scientist drives the truck onto the destroyed roof of the laboratory, which collapses under the weight. The second effect occurs, activating the explosives. A bright red light surrounded by a dark tunnel is seen. Zack regains consciousness on the beach and sees strange cloud formations rising from the ocean, resembling water spouts. He walks to the water's edge in shock, observing a huge planet surrounded by rings rising above the horizon. As the only survivor of the new effect, Zack, holding his dictaphone, looks at his unearthly surroundings in confusion and despair. The plot of the story is based on a real incident involving an American tourist who visited New Zealand in the 1970s. The fact is that New Zealanders sleep late on weekends, and when the man walked the streets of Auckland one morning, he found the capital completely deserted. His tale of feeling like the last surviving person on Earth inspired Craig Harrison's novel.